Thank you all. Um, I'd like to say that my co colleagues here, D David Bassett and Scott Conger, this particular project came about from a bike ride that we had. We started comparing uh, our travels in terms of our perceptions of good places to live, safe places to bike, and it all came back to uh, us asking this one question. Why the South? Why is the South tending to have the higher prevalences of obesity among adults? And why the South in terms of the highest proportion of people who are physically inactive? And we started to talk about the reasons why that the Southern region may be driving or have these higher risk profiles. And I'd be remiss when we talk about the South not to talk about the natural environment and acknowledge that all of us live in a, a place where heat and humidity is something that may impact our decision to go outside and be physically active. This particular slide shows a, a study we did on a local greenway where we found that the daily activity use is related closely to temperature. And you can see as uh, temperature goes up, uh, activity use goes, increases up until around 84 degrees. And at that point, we see physical activity go down. So David and uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, I'm blocking on my name, um, um, started talking about some of the reasons why outside of the natural environment, knowing that the natural environment and season, seasonal temporarity um, impacts or is related to the level of physical activity. So taking natural environment aside, we start ta we've started talking about the built environment and recognizing that where we live probably impacts, either hinders or promotes our level of outside physical activity. Going out and biking, walking, jogging, uh, using a bike path, depending on whether if it's accessible to us, going to a local park if it's accessible to us, looking at the infrastructure for public transportation, the, the characteristics of an activity-friendly community are fairly well known, and at the local level, we know that there's variation. But we were asking, to what degree can we talk about the regional perspective of the built environment, and are there any correlates and any major differences that we see? So we started this project about a year and a half ago. It's intended to evolve into a multi-level modeling project of data that we've captured from several published data sets and reports. So this is not data we've actually collected, but we're just going out and gleaming data from other reports, creating this data set that eventually will lead to a multi-level modeling. The data that we utilized, and I'll provide a snapshot today, relates to uh, and revolves around the U.S. Census regional um, perspective. We're going to be talking about walkability, urban sprawl, bicycle and walking infrastructure, pedestrian and cycling fatalities, leisure time physical activity, as well as active commuting and transportational physical activity. All of that will take that regional perspective, will compare to the different regions, and I'll show you some relationships or associations that are sort of setting the stage for our next phase. So let's talk about infrastructure. The infrastructure related to walking and cycling, with first looking at walkability using the walk score. So find your state right here. I've highlighted in gray all the southern states. A low score implies low walkability. In other words, there are fewer places to walk to near where people live across that state. The southern states are on the low end of walkability. If you look at cities, now I've highlighted uh, among the top 50 cities, the low walkable states in the south. Only two of these states, I believe, are associated with the SEC. But you can see states and cities have low walkability. So how does that relate to actually physical activity? In this case, if we look at walkability, 
and we compare it to or associate it with walking to work, walking for a trip, we see that there is a, a fairly positive association between walkability of where you live and electing to walk to work in this case. Now, I've highlighted the southern states, and if you'll see, they're more towards the left side of the low walkability, and they're definitely on the low side of walking to work. So how many of you all actually walked to your school sometime last week or any time in the past month? You took a walk to work. That's maybe about 40% of the audience. If we were at the Big Ten schools, do you think we'd see a higher prevalence of people walking or cycling? I think we might, I'll try to get to the answer to that, what we might hypothesize. If we look at cities in terms of walking to work, we see a more positive association. In this case, the southern cities are highlighted with a circle with no, that, that's blank. And you can see we have the cluster of low walkability among our cities in the south. And we have low proportions of people who walk. In terms of bicycle commuting, uh, I've actually been hit by a car once, and that will refer to another slide. Um, we see that the bicycling infrastructure, the number of bike mixed paths dedicated to bikes or bike lanes are very, very low in the south. And the proportion of people actually walking or biking to work, very, very low. So we see that cluster to the, uh, let me go over here, cluster over here, the southern cities. Fatalities, pedestrian and bicycling. Here's bicycling in the gray. Black is, uh, pedestrian or black, bicycling is gray. By region, the magnitude and the exposure rate of those, ten, every 10,000 people who walk or bike in terms of exposures, the fatality rates are so much higher in the South. And this re reflection possibly of the poor, lower infrastructure that we have in the South related to walking or biking. What about sprawl? Can you take a car or do you have to take a car to get somewhere? Do you live, do people in, in cities live near where jobs are? Street network, is it conducive to getting out and walking to destinations? And do the jobs, uh, or how closely integrated are to where people live? So the sprawl index, which we obtained from the Smart Growth America, is standardized to a mean of 100 with a standard deviation of 25. So anything below that implies sprawl, below 100. Anything above 100 implies density and probably good markers for um, uh, being physically active. Of the most dense, walkable cities in America uh, with less urban sprawl, we only see two southern cities, Miami and Laredo, Texas. Among the cities with the most sprawl, if you look down at the regional column, you see the south populates most of the most sprawling cities. And um, in terms of Tennessee, where I'm from, four of the most sprawling cities are located in my state, with Knoxville, Tennessee being the second largest or most sprawling metropolitan statistical area in the South. And I think David and Scott and I would concur that basically in Knoxville, you have to get in a car to go to the grocery store. You, to get to work, you're taking 10, 15, 25 minute commutes. So we, we can say for certain that there is a, a great deal of sprawl there. Now, all four composites of the sprawl index are on this table, but I want to look at, show you the composite sprawl. In the south, the sprawl index is 87.2. It's the lowest region with the greatest sprawl. The highest sprawl is related to the northeast area or region. Other indicators, the only one that's not significant between uh, the different regions 
or the street connectivity. But in terms of land use mix and density and activity centering, we see that uh, the south falls behind in terms of uh, indicators of sprawl. So this is a, a two more slides, very quick perspectives of the south versus the other regions re related to the infrastructure and related to physical activity. Just to give you a quick snapshot as we sort of close on where we're going next. First, the walk score. I'm going to go down these one by one very quickly. There is an L and an H, low meaning that our walk score in the southern region for the state is the lowest of any region, the highest being the northeast. Commuting by foot, active commuting, walking to work, south the lowest. Commuting by bike, south is the lowest in terms of mean ranking. Percent commuting overall through fit tr active transportation, south is the lowest. And the proportion of people meeting the, the guidelines for physical activity, as reflected in this, the second slide I showed, south has the lowest proportion of people meeting those guidelines. Now fatalities, we lead among the regions in terms of bicycle fatalities and pedestrian fatalities. So for almost every marker that we've looked at in terms of the built environment at this point of our project, the southern region has less indicators or uh, indicators of less promotion of physical activity for the outside. When we look at the city level perspective, walk score, the lowest. Commuting by foot among in the city level, the lowest. By bike, the lowest. Total miles of bike infrastructure, mixed dedicated paths or bike lanes, south has the fewest number of dedicated bicycle infrastructure compared to any other region. Sidewalks, we have the fewer proportion of sidewalks per square mile than any region. And we have the greatest or lowest proportion, greatest proportion of people who are physically inactive or who meet the guidelines. So everything we've looked at is on, um, you know, we're all sitting wondering, well, why don't we move to Boulder? Uh, one of the things that David and I do whenever we travel, we come back and say, hey, I went to Austin, Texas, and you know, they have this, they have that. Um, we compare cities and infrastructure and, and talk about where we could bike and where we couldn't bike. So this leads sort of into the discussion that um, we have sort of are taking in our minds right now. If you live in the South, typically an adult probably lives on a street with no bikes, lanes, no sidewalks. And you may not have those near you. And if you do elect to go out and walk or bike, you may have to get in your car to drive somewhere to get access to a park or you may have to share the roads with a car, and you may be more likely to be involved, involved in an accident. And lastly, we, we know that the South, with the sprawl, we probably are relying on taking our car to get to different locations. Uh, and, and everything that would promote physical activity is basically not present in the South overall in general terms compared to other regions in the country. Now, why? We we're offering four different points. And we, we can't, a lot of these are just things that we're talking about right now. We don't have a lot of evidence, but we think that the reliance on cars that were de, uh, in early in the century that the rural area of the South, when we finally did start to see expansion, we were so reliant on cars that the development, the planning, if there were planning, was just designed really to get cars from one place to the other quicker. And that people started to live away from destinational opportunities 
And we just evolved into this large, sprawling, car-reliant society, mainly from delayed growth after cars. And all the other regions, perhaps, had developed their city infrastructure around different um, uh, pedestrian and cycling infrastructures. Two, tax revenues that cities in the South, states in the South, the 10 states with the lowest per capita local and state tax rates are in the South. And the infrastructure, the, the monetary possible funding for bicycling and cycling infrastructure, greenway development, park development may not be there. So that may be one of the last things that part, or cities and states consider in terms of quality of life and planning. Our transportation planners in Knoxville talk, tell us that they think the smart growth initiatives and design characteristics haven't really been embraced by southern communities compared to other communities. And, and this is where the transportation planners really need to be involved in trying to help interpret some of our data. And we are trying to integrate them into our next phase. And lastly, uh, coming from East Kentucky where I grew up and hearing and seeing poverty, I realized that social economic disadvantage, which sort of reflects uh, one of the limitations of our study, uh, this notion of self-selection, that people who value activity move to places where they can be active. They move to places where they're parked. They, they want to live somewhere where they can easily do things. This, this notion of self-selection. Our study really can't control for that because it's cross-sectional. But people who don't have the advantages that maybe we have can't really get up and move to a place that they might want to live. And where they live now may not have that infrastructure. And they're uh, in the South, perhaps, this higher level of disadvantages may lead to uh, less mobility. Uh, all of these things we're sort of mixing around right now as we prepare for this next phase multi-level modeling. So with that, I'll, I'll close. And I believe there's a little bit of time for question and answers. I'll try to answer. Over here. Uh, thanks for your nice talk. Um, so I was thinking that earlier in the conference we talked about if it's hot out, if it's hot out, one doesn't exercise as much. And when I think about the South, I think it's hot, and I think, oh my God, I'm not going to walk or bike to work and get all sweaty. And so there feels like there's some environment, natural environmental conditions that really. Uh, are disadvantage people in the South from embracing those kinds of endeavors. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, that's why I wanted to acknowledge very in the very first few slides that we do know that the natural environment uh, does relate to physical activity. So I think all of us in here, I, I think the hottest city in the South is Columbia, South Carolina. I know every time I visit Columbia, I know Steve and Russ, I, I think it's the, my, my wife did residency program there, and when I would visit, I would just, it's hotter than Tuscaloosa where I went to school. Uh, I can only say, yeah, we're going to build in the natural environment into that multi-level modeling. It is, it can be oppressive. But on the other hand, it gets pretty cold and a lot of snow in Minneapolis, so over the course of the year, what is the average temperature, say, in Minneapolis or Columbia? I mean, it's, it goes yeah. both ways, actually. Yeah. It, it, it does, and, and we are going to try to incorporate that into our, our programming. I think, though, the people, and I think in Minnesota, I think that they transition into to winter sports. The, the, the activity, that they have other ways for leisure activity that they integrate into. In the South, when we when it becomes hot, humid. Now, keep in mind, I think we might see less outdoor physical activity, but people may transition to more indoor physical activity uh, during those months. Now, that's something that a lot of our, our national surveys and data points have a hard time capturing in terms of 
um, leisure time, physical activity, it's, it's harder to distinguish between indoor or outdoor. In fact, I don't think we really do that. So you could play, I know in Knoxville, you could play racquetball outside and inside. So when we assess racquetball and other types of activities, it could be done in any of those different domains or outside. I don't know if you all heard that, but uh, it's something about the interaction with driving that we perceive that there's so many bad drivers that maybe we don't elect to go outside. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Um, the expo the, one of the reasons why we see lower fatalities is hypothesized in different regions is there's more bikers and cyclists out on the road. Uh, and cars are more familiar with them being there and they're less likely to be accidents. So having more people on the roads may lower fatalities because drivers interact more and be, there probably may be more infrastructure with that. Kind of along the same lines, I'm wondering what impact you think exercise culture or lack thereof has on these regional differences and um, what can be done to help improve that? that that's a big picture question that gets down to uh, prenatal childhood uh, experiences that we had with physical activity uh, through, through the time we're at the university. And, and it's really tough to take, to, to answer. We're not really going to be able to take those individual factors, I think, and integrate them into our work. But certainly, uh, the way our parents model physical activity the types of education we got, the, the, our access to parks and being able to go outside and play. We know for safe routes to school, walking and biking to work, one of the greatest barriers for kids getting out and being active in, in terms of getting to school is related to uh, parental perceptions. I don't think my son or daughter's safe and I'm not going to let them walk despite even having a greenway going to school with that. It sounds like you almost answered that question earlier when you mentioned, you know, why do we live here? Why don't we move to Boulder? Um, is there, you know, what do you think about the idea that maybe the built environment is almost pushing people who are, who would sort of um, start an ex exercise culture and be a part of um, building more of a physically active community, um, being um, almost pushed out by the natural environment um, and the, the built environment being so uh, unconducive to uh, physical activity and exercise. I'm having a hard time understanding your question. The natural okay, so my question is, um, you mentioned that, you know, you said to you, uh, your colleague, um, why do we live here? Why don't we move to Boulder? Um, do you feel that there's uh, an effect of almost pushing people out who would be building that exercise culture, who, um, you know, maybe is it that all the active people have left? Yeah, is yeah, basically yeah, yeah, my question. yeah, yeah. Self-selection, uh, uh, certainly, if, if given the opportunity to move, my wife and I, as we think about retirement, we're going to be looking at quality of life. We may move away from Knoxville, Tennessee, the most sprawling city, to go somewhere else to live simply because it's not uh, the lifestyle that we may enjoy and appreciate as we get into our elder years. So, yeah, certainly self-selection with that. 